happening in Luke chapter 19. And just going to take this a little further tonight. This topic of occupy, occupy till he comes. This is Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Because here he tells why that he spoke the parable. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. They believed that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to establish his earthly kingdom. Totally misunderstanding what was happening there. But he was, he, he gave this parable to describe what he was doing and how that the believers should respond. He said, verse 12, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your presence in this place tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you, that you are speaking to us and you are, Lord, just working in our lives, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that, that you're preparing us uh, for these last days. Help us, Lord, to be right in step with your plan. And, Lord, and to open our eyes and our hearts to the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Occupy. I, I didn't really uh, think about the, uh, the very strong uh, correlation between what was happening at this time, the, when Jesus spoke these words, Occupy till I come. And I made reference this morning to a movement that you've probably heard about in the news over the past months that started, from what I understand, it started in New York City, the Occupy Wall Street movement. And, uh, you know, a lot of differences of opinions about what is going on there. But I do know that it's been going on since September of last year. Literally thousands of people camping out in uh, uh Zuccotti Park, which is located in New York City's Wall Street Financial District. And so they are, they're just camped out there in, in public protest to the fact that uh, on Wall Street, no doubt that there have been some who have taken advantage, and we would never condone the taking advantage of, of those that are less fortunate uh, by people that are powerful in the, the finance world. And that's, that's not what I intend to do. But uh, uh, the real issue was with all these people who are involved every day in investments, multiplied millions, billions of dollars that are invested and worked at, through uh, the avenue of uh, the stock market. And, uh, uh, but they've been, they've been protesting now, not only in New York City, but in other cities across the country. At one time, back in the fall in October, there were as many as 100,000 people camped out and, uh, in New York City to protest what was going on there. Now, I, I don't think it's wrong to protest, but I do believe that in nine months' time, there's something a lot more constructive that you can do than just camp out in a park. I really believe that. And uh, protest, sure, do that for a day or two, then then get on to the business of doing what needs to be done. And if you're concerned about the economy and making money, how much money could have been made in those nine months by those people? So I found it interesting that there was, there was a, that this was an, uh, a debate over investments and the type of investments and wealthy people and their investments. And then Jesus giving to those ten servants a command telling them, I'm going to give you all the same pound, 10 pounds, 10 gifts. This pound was probably worth about $20. And he gave to each one of them $20. And he said, occupy till I come. And the word literally means 
get down to business, get to work, invest this, do something with it, and cause it to multiply. And then when I return, then the rewards will be handed out. You'll be re rewarded accordingly to your willingness to do what I am calling you to do. Now we know that the message here is that, that uh, Jesus was telling those uh, followers, those disciples, I'm going away, but I'm going to come back. And what I have given to you, every one of you, is a wonderful, valuable gift. And what are you going to do with this gift? Are you, gonna, are you going to invest it? Are you going to invest it into the kingdom of God and into the lives of people? I believe that this gift is best represented by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the gift was. The Bible says that, that we, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's the message of the gospel. We take it for granted uh, here because, you know, so many of us, so we've heard the, the gospel, we've read through the Bible, we, we, we know about the gospel message, but that's not the way that it is all over the world. Many, many places all over the world, uh, estimated half of the population of the world, have, have never really heard a thorough um, uh, message of the gospel. Uh, and so literally billions of people in this world have never heard, and we've heard it so much, it's just commonplace to us. But we need to be reminded of the fact that it's a gift from God and it's a treasure. It's something very, very valuable. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Something very valuable. And we need to be about the business of investing in the kingdom of God. Now, this, is, this message is a not, not about busyness, not about filling your schedule so full that you don't have time to do anything, because I really think that that, is, that, that will, will hinder your doing the business of the kingdom of God. But we are to be about the, the business. We are to daily understand that we have been given a treasure, a gift from God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, a dispensation of the gospel is what it's called in one place. Amen. A stewardship of the gospel, a treasure in earthen vessels. That's what we have been given. Amen. All of us have. We've been given this wonderful treasure. And you know, the Lord knows what you're doing with it. The Lord knows that what, when you read about those seven churches there in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, those seven churches, and every one of them, the voice of the Lord spoke, and uh, the Lord said about each of those churches, I know your works. What he was saying is, I know what's going on in your church. I know what's going on. There's nothing hid from my eyes. I know what's going on. You may have you know, maybe able to present yourself in such a way that, that uh, everyone thinks that you're just really right in step with the plan of God, but in, in your heart, deep in your heart, you're, you, there's really not much of a commitment to the things of the Lord. Each one of them, to Ephesus and Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Smyrna, Pergamos, each one of them, many of them had commendable things about them, good things about them, but in each case, Jesus said, I know your works. I know what you're doing. And so the Lord is very much aware of what you are doing with the gift that he's handed to you. He knows what's going on uh, in your life. And if you are really willing to invest, this, this, is a, this, this is a message about investment. You know, investment is, is about what you do now that is going to pay dividend down the road. What you do right now that's going to pay off to your advantage next month, a few months from now, next year, or years to come. I, I've mentioned this before, but when I went to Bible college in 1973, that uh, it was, Neosho was right there near um, Bentonville, Arkansas, where Sam Walton started all the Walmart stores. And the first ones that were started were in that part of the of the country, and there was a Walmart store that had opened uh, right there in Neosho, where I was going to Bible college. And uh, the uh, I can remember seeing, and they still have it posted, I believe, uh, that you you can purchase stock, you can buy into the company, 
And uh, employees can do it, or just anyone, if you've got some money, you can buy in and, in, into Walmart. And uh, I got to thinking about this, and I looked into this sometime a couple years ago, and I, I found out that if I would have only had $1,000, that's not a lot of money, really. But when you're a Bible school student and you're you know, 18 years old, $1,000 was everything. I didn't have it. I probably didn't have $10. And, uh, I, you know, just poor and barely surviving. But if I would have only had $1,000 and had, uh, had the, the insight into what it means to invest, that today that $1,000 would, would be worth almost just under $2.5 million. Glory to God. Amen. Oh, I should have got. I should have done something and got that money, but I, I didn't have the. I didn't have it, and I didn't know how to get it, and I didn't even know the value of investing in something like that at that age. I, I really didn't understand. Now that's just that's in uh, uh, that's a natural uh, comparison to what it, to to what uh, investment is really all about. And we're talking about spiritual investment. You remember when Jesus sat by the treasury and he watched how people gave and there was one lady that came and all she had was two mites. Let's give her the credit for, for what it says. We always talk about the widow's mite, but the Bible says she had two. <laughs> and, but it still wasn't worth much. That each of those mites was, was, was worth about a half a penny. And so she had one penny. If she had two mites, she probably had the value of one penny. But someone has taken the time uh, to figure out what that would have been worth if she could have at that time invested that one penny into the Bank of Jerusalem at 4% interest for 2,000 years. That's a long time. If she would have invested that penny at 4% interest, it would be worth today more than $5 billion. And Jesus saw the investment that she made, and he knew how valuable that it was. Amen. Not just monetary value, but an investment for the future, an investment in the kingdom of God, investment in souls. If you've given to missions for years and years and years and and we've done that, and I know many of you have, have contributed to missions uh, o over uh, the years. And, and uh, you have no way of even understanding or even comprehending how that, that those gifts are compounding in heaven. Amen. You have no way, your, your mind can't even comprehend what you have done and, and uh, the, the work that you've, you've done for God and the investments that you've made in the kingdom of God, there's no way that you could even comprehend. And one of the joys of heaven is the rewards that are going to be passed out and to see that, that your little effort that you invested in the kingdom of God, oh, it made such a big difference. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. To know that, that uh, the, the labor and the work and whatever you do for the glory of God, that, that one of these days that, uh, that there's going to be a reward. That's what he said. Occupy until I come. See the value of investing in the kingdom of God, not just with money, but just see the value of taking what God has given to you, which literally is this wonderful treasure, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everywhere you go and every opportunity that God gives to you, you invest it. You invested. You, you, you invested in the lives of people. We went down to Carmichael just before the choir practice, and Lee Williams and his family were there to, to, uh, for his viewing. And uh, when we went through the, the, uh, the front there by the, the casket, Lee's son, Mike, we shook hands with him and then went on. And then he came back to us and, and got to Marcia and he said, I just want you to know that it was in a revival years and years and years ago. And your daddy was preaching and my dad got saved in that revival. And I got saved in the same revival. I want you to know that. Amen. Amen. It might have been 40 years ago or, or, or longer, 50 maybe years ago. And it may not have seemed like it was all that significant of a service 
or revival, but it was an investment in people and lives and souls were saved and lives were, were changed for the glory of God because there was, there was this willingness to, to give out the gospel. Amen. Amen. What, a, what an encouragement that that is to know. And heaven is going to be a wonderful place because a lot of the things that you don't, you don't know about, you can't even comprehend, but you, you gave little, but God turned it into much. Amen. Because he, he can use your willingness to invest in the kingdom of God. That's what the word occupy means. It doesn't mean set in a tent on Wall Street. Amen. It means invest. Get involved in business that's important. Invest in things that really count. By the way, thank, thank uh, James Hacker for putting that together. Isn't that beautiful? There's the, there's the harvest field and the clock up there showing the, 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 uh, the end is near. And uh, thank God for people that know how to do that. I wish I knew how to make those pictures like that, but I don't. But I want to learn. I'm going to try to learn how to do that. Amen. But it gets, it get, helps, gets the message across, doesn't it? That we are to be busy occupying for God. So what are you doing right now for Christ that is going to last what is it that you're doing for Christ that's going to expand and grow? I've heard about churches that have had uh, uh, fundraisers where they handed out $50 bills. Have you ever heard of this before? The pastor get, would get up and say, all right, I've got a whole handful of $50 bills. And he'd, he'd hand one out to everybody that was willing to take one. And with that $50 bill that they made a commitment that within three months, four months, or however long a time that they set, that they were to bring that 50 back and they were to have used it and invested it in some way, use that money to expand it, to increase it, and then bring the $50 back and whatever other monies that were, were, were made, people did all kinds of things. They, took, they, they made cookies and, and sold them on their jobs and, and uh, they did everything that they could think of and people came back and... Uh, I'm talking about people took that $50, and, I, and I've heard about this in several different uh, uh, scenarios where they, they handed out maybe 30, 40, 50 of these $50 bills, and it, and it, uh, it was an investment of maybe twelve or $1,500, but it came back thousands and thousands of dollars. And it was not only a gift to the church, but it was also a lesson in how we are to use what God gives to us and make an investment and use what he's given to us to grow it, to expand it. Amen. I mentioned this morning that we are, we are living right now in probably the most tremendous times ever in the history of the church. Don't think the first century church had it better or more exciting. Don't think that any time in the history of the church that it was better or more exciting. Right now, here we are. At the very closing of this age and this, this dispensation. And we, we need to, to realize that our time is short. And what God has given to us, we need to invest it. Now some of these investments that we make in people, you may see them in this life. Most of them you won't. But some of them you will if you invest in the lives of people. And you pour out of yourself. And as we were watching that uh, slideshow this morning from Anne's uh, missionary work and heard her tell about uh, teaching young girls who have been displaced and abused, teaching them how to read and teaching them how to, to feel like that they're valuable and that they have a place in, in the world and in the kingdom of God. My, that's an investment that, that after a, a year or so, you can start seeing that. In, in this, there's some investments that we make in people and in the kingdom of God. We won't know about it until we get into the presence of the Lord. But we have been called of God. And we have been gifted with the gospel. And we are to occupy until he comes. We are, we are really living in what some have called the rapture generation. The rapture generation. We're, we're living in an age, more than likely, people that are right here sitting in this service here tonight will witness and experience the rapture of the church. Wow. Amen. There's a very, very high possibility that there are those right here in this building tonight that 
that we're living in that generation that's going to experience the catching away. The, the, the Greek word is the perusio, the, the, the catching away of the church. Praise God. What, an, what a, an amazing thought. We know that time is short, and that's why that the message was so brief and so clear when he handed them the gift. Occupy till I come. Invest until I come. Be busy for God until I come. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So because of, uh, of the, the great uh, treasure and the great privilege that we have, we're to be living with a readiness and an expectancy and uh, always uh, loving His appearing, longing for His appearing, looking for His appearing. The Lord is coming soon. What are we to be doing? Busy. Stay busy investing in the kingdom of God, investing in souls through our, our every means that the Lord gives to us. Amen. If you'll be faithful, what God has given to you, it will grow. It will expand. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, principle of the kingdom of God that if the seed is planted, you're going to see fruit, you're going to see growth, be willing to do it. Amen. Be willing to do it and to be faithful to give. This morning we talked about several places in the scripture where there, there were uh, these admonitions to do certain things because Jesus is coming soon. One was that we are to be busy reaching the lost. Another one was that we need to be committing ourselves, make a commitment to the work of the ministry. Another one, we, we need to be patient and steadfast and, and just wait to believe that God is going to fulfill what he has promised that he would do. Another one was that we are to, to live a holy life because we know that that will, um, uh, that uh, the fact that Jesus is coming motivates us to live a holy life. Or it should. Amen. He that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. Amen. He's examining himself. Right? Amen. Let me just mention a few other things that we need to be doing since we know that Jesus is coming soon. Number one, we need to be spiritual people. We need to be spiritual people, people of the Spirit, people who live in the Spirit, people who walk in the Spirit, live by uh, the Spirit. Colossians chapter 3, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear unto him in glory. Amen. Your focus needs to be on high things, spiritual things, the things of God, not on the things of this world. Set your affection on things that are above, not things that are on this, in this world. Don't get wrapped up in things of this world, but instead be a spiritual person. Live above uh, the world and all of the influences of the, of the world. You need to be a, a spiritual, godly person. Amen, because Jesus is coming very, very soon. Another thing that the Scripture says, and we read this all the time whenever we, we receive communion, and that is uh, we, we need to come to a communion service, and that the Scripture says that it reminds us of the sacrifice of our Lord. It reminds us of, of uh, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and His body was broken, His, his blood was shed for us that we might be saved. And so we come to the, to the communion service, the Lord's table, as a reminder to us of what he has done. And it says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Till he come. Stay at it. Always make sure that that uh, your focus is on the, the sacrifice of our Lord and what he has done. And we, did, we are to do that until the Lord comes. Another thing is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Bible says that with this hope that we have, we're able to comfort those uh, around us who lose their loved ones. 
Tim LaHaye wrote the series Left Behind, sold like 40 million, literally. It's one of the biggest sellers as far as a Christian book ever. And uh, became, they, they turned it into to, to movies and uh, just huge, huge uh, interest in that. Tim LaHaye said that when he was nine years old, his, his dad died. And uh, he was so heartbroken that around the, at the graveside that he was weeping. And his uncle, who was also his pastor, came up to him and put his arm around him and encouraged him and, let, and reminding him, listen, this is just temporary. The Lord is going to come. He's going to come soon. And then we're going to go to be with our, our loved ones. And so he said that those words of comfort have stayed with him. And all through the years of his ministry, they was, he was uh, uh, focused upon the fact that Jesus could come at any time. And that was one of the motivations for writing the Left Behind book. Amen. Comfort one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would have you to be ignorant. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. We have hope. Amen. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say that unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. What a comfort. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. The Lord is going to come. The trumpet is going to sound. And uh, there's gonna, the, uh, the, the believers on this earth, the, those that are born again, are going to exit this world in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Faster than that. They're going to exit this world. And we're going to meet those loved ones in the air, the Bible says. Amen. Glory to God. Now that is a comforting thought, isn't it? Amen. To know that our friends and our loved ones and those that have already gone on, our family, they're all already gone to heaven and in the presence of the Lord. What a wonderful reunion. We comfort one another with the message that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Another admonition in the scripture that relates to the coming of the Lord, uh, we're, we're to, I've already mentioned, we're to, we're to be a spiritual people. We're to, to have the right focus when we take the Lord's Supper. We're to comfort one another with the message of, of uh, the coming of, of the Lord. And then the scripture says we're also to be faithful and be to, to be committed to the church. Faithful to the church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. When you see all the signs that Jesus is coming soon, it should be a motivator, motivator to you. I want to be in the house of God. I want to be with the people of God. I want to hear about God. I want to worship God. I want to have that kind of, a, of a, an opportunity to fellowship with the Lord every time that I possibly can. Amen. Faithful to the house of the Lord. Even the Lord's coming motivates us to be faithful to church. Amen. There's, there's others I could go through here tonight, but, but I just wanted to give you a few, a few of these things that are to be things we are to be busy doing until he comes. And remember the, the, the important message of, in, of, of we have been called of God, we've been given a gift, and we are to invest it. Amen. Invest it. When you read the parable, there, were, there, was, there was one who was afraid to invest. One of the servants said, I, I didn't do it. I was afraid. I didn't invest. The judgment, one of the judgments that came upon him was that his his gift was handed to the one, given to the one that, in, that had 10 talents and invested those for return. Amen. If you're not willing to let God work in your life and to be used of the Lord, it could be that your opportunity, your talent will be taken away from you, given to somebody else so that they 
can invest in the kingdom of God. The call of God is occupy, occupy. Be busy for God. Be busy. Be involved in the business of investing in the kingdom of God, in the lives of people. Great joy in this world and great reward in the world that is to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.